So I wonder how you solved these problems from the last lesson. It's Mrs. Parry, we're back again and we're looking at fractions. I've just completed the first ones for you. I thought it'd be quite interesting to have a quick look at how we could have solved them. You were given three options. Your first option was to use the proportional relationship. So we were looking at this relationship and you could have done that for any of these. Your second method was to have a look at the scaling relationship, so going across the equivalent fractions. And again, you could have done that with any of these. And then your third relationship, your third solution was to look at your times tables. And again, you could have done that for any of these. Well done for getting those answers. If you're not sure about any of them, take them back to your teacher or to your adult in the house and talk about why my answers are different to yours. Let's look in depth now at the next one. This one seemed a bit trickier to me than the previous ones. And I think the reason for that is because the, um, the denominators aren't in a sequence. So we had to really, really keep thinking about the proportional relationship within, or we needed to be looking at the scaling relationship across. Let's start by looking at the very, very first empty number box here and deciding how we'd deal, deal with that one. That's right. I looked and I noticed that there was a scaling relationship of times eight for the numerator. And then I remembered I needed to do the same to the denominator and that gave me the answer 40. I hope that was where you started. So when I looked at the next fraction that I was dealing with, I had a quick look here and I looked to see if I could find a way to find that relationship, but I decided I was better off going back to my starting fraction. Once I was back at the starting fraction, I could see a relationship between these two. Did you see it? I know because they're equivalent fractions. So we're looking at fractions that have got the same value, but have got a different appearance. So if I've multiplied the denominator by three, then I'm going to have to do the same to the numerator, and that's going to give me an answer of six. Great, we're getting on really, really well here. Let's look and see the relationship. Yeah, I've gone back to the starting fraction again. Let's look at the relationship between 5 and 35. I bet you saw that it was multiplying by 7. So we did the same to the numerator and that gave us a new equivalent fraction of 14 35ths. So 14 35ths is in fact the same value as 2 fifths, but it's got a different appearance. And on. OK, so let's have a quick look down here. We've got a change, haven't we, when we move to this next fraction, because this next pair of fractions, we're missing the denominators, which means we've got to look for relationships with our numerators. Now, my first thought was I could go back to my starting fraction. Can you see that? Yeah, me too. So. What I would do for that one is if my starting fraction needs to be scaled up by 14 for the numerator, I need to do the same for my denominator. And that gets me an answer of my new fraction being 28 seventieths. That's interesting. It's got the same relationship, 28 seventieths, as two fifths. Great. But then I had a quick look and I thought, well, I could have used the next door fraction because 14 to 28 is a scale factor of two, so I could have doubled 35 to get to 70. It doesn't matter which fraction you use because they're all equivalents. OK. OK, here we go. I wonder if when you got these final three fractions, you started to get a little bit worried because there are lots and lots of parts in these ones, aren't there? Of course, we didn't need to worry because we know that they are all equivalent to two fifths. Let's have a quick look at how we could have solved this denominator. Of course, we've been given the numerator, so we need to look to the numerator 
and find a relationship. We could have gone back to our starting. Our starting numerator was two. And I know that if I go up a factor of 16, I will go from two to 32 in my numerator. That means I'd have to multiply five by 16 to get to 80. I also had a quick look and I realized that this fraction could have helped me because if I scale up by two, 16 to get to 32, then I could scale up by two from 40 to get to 80. So two solutions to get the same um, fraction here. And it was the same for this one. I could see a relationship between 15 and 75. I could also see a relationship with this denominator, 5 and 75. I wonder which one you chose to do. Let's just finish our home learning, our practice session uh, from the last lesson by looking at how we could have solved this final one. 92. Hmm. What I needed to do for this was I needed to look at the 92 and I needed to work out how I would have scaled up from 2 to get to 92. I used a vision for that because it was 92 divided by 2 makes 46. So that meant that to go from 2 all the way to 92 meant uh, scaling up by 46. If I did that to the numerator, then we know I needed to do that to the denominator as well. 5 times 46. I could have used my fingers. Might have gone wrong, though, because that's quite a lot of counting up in fives. I also could have got out a pencil and paper, but I chose to use a mental method. 5 times 46 is the same as 10 times 46 and then halve it. 1046 is uh, 460, and then halve it is 230. I wonder which method you used. Wow, these look less complicated than the last one, don't they? We've moved on to new learning now. And in this slide, we are going to be looking at how you find a numerator, the missing numerator in an equivalent fraction. Let's have a look. I'm starting at the bottom for a change because it's quite fun to change. So our fraction has a proportional relationship of, that's right, five. We've been given the denominator here of five. And we know that one is one fifth of five. That means we need to do the same for this equivalent fraction. We've been given the denominator of 10. If we divide that by five, we're going to get our new answer of two. Two tenths is an equivalent fraction for one fifth. They have the same value, but a different appearance. Remember, we've got to keep the proportional relationship the same when we do the other two questions. Pause the video and have a go at it now. Welcome back. I hope you got the same answers as me. OK, let's move on to the next slide where we're going to look at the missing denominators. Here is our missing denominator. We know we've got to keep this new fraction as the same proportion as this one because we're looking for an equivalent fraction, which is a fraction of the same value but a different appearance. So our relationship here is from 6 to 12. That proportional relationship is, that's right, we scaled it up by 2, haven't we? We're going to have to do the same here. That means we're going to want to scale up by a factor of 2. 1 times 2 is 2. Could we have done it by dividing? Yeah, we could have done, couldn't we? We could instead have looked at this relationship. So this was 6 divided by 6 is 1. 
and we'd have needed to do the same here. 12 divided by 6 is 2. You knew what you were going to get on this slide, didn't you? In the last ones, we've had missing numerators, we've had missing denominators. So on this one, we were going to get both. I wonder if you expected them to still be equivalent fractions. And I wonder if you also thought that we might change where we put a fraction that we've got both the numerator and the denominator. It doesn't matter which side of the equal side it is, does it? Because we know that these are equivalent fractions. So have a go. Think really carefully. Are you scaling up or down to find our missing numerator and our missing denominator? Did you get the same answers as me? Well done. You've really learned well. Well, this is an unusual problem, isn't it? Because I've got two missing boxes. It says to me here, what could the missing digits be? I wonder if there's more than one answer. How am I going to solve it? I think what I'm going to do first of all is I'm just going to see if I made one of the numerators one. Let's have a look. Oh, it still doesn't give me the answer to the second numerator. So I guess what I need to do is I need to be looking at the relationship between my denominators. What scale factor would I need to go from 11 to 88? Yeah, I bet you've got that one now. We scaled it up by 8, didn't we? So if we did that to the denominator, we're going to have to do the same to the numerator, aren't we? A little picture there of the image. Can you see this is in 11th and each one of these boxes down here. Yep, there's 88 of them. So if I've done the scaling up for the denominator, I'm going to have to scale up by the same amount for the numerator. Hmm. Is that the only way to solve it? No, I don't think so either. Let's look at the next slide. OK, so we're back to the same problem. We've got the two empty numerator boxes. But what I've done this time is I've changed my image down here and I've given me two elevenths. My scale factor is still going to be the same, isn't it? It's going to be a scale factor of eight. So if I've gone for two elevenths, then yeah, two times eight is 16 eighty-eighths. I don't think that's the end of this. I think I could find other solutions to this problem. Why don't you have a go with it now and then show your teacher all the different ways that you've done? That would be a really interesting challenge. So here's one and it really, really clearly tells you in the question that you need to find as many ways as you can to solve this problem. The difference from the last one? Yep, that's a good question. Can you see this time we've got missing denominators, but we're still looking at equivalent fractions. What I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you to see how many different ways you can do this. Off you go. Welcome back. Now I've got my notes down here and I came up with lots of different ways. First of all, I thought to myself, OK, I'm going to try three sixths. Yep, that would work. And oh, I also had to go at, uh, I had to do six twelfths. Then I had another look and I thought, yep, three quarters. And I would need to scale up my denominator if it was quarters then the new one would need to be eighths. So for those ones, I was working in proper fractions. I also had a bit of fun playing with improper fractions. I looked at it and I thought I could have three halves and six halves. I wonder how many you found. Was there a number that you could find that was a total number or could it just have gone on forever? Talk to your teacher about that one. I really, really like this problem. We've got two more problems and then we're going to be moving on to um, our independent activity before the next lesson. Let's start by reading this question. OK, can you circle the fraction which is equivalent to the fraction card? 
So let's start by looking at the fraction card. A fraction card is four sevenths. I'm just going to have a quick think about what that number actually means. It's a whole that's divided into seven equal parts. That's what the denominator means. And we've got four of those equal parts, four sevenths. It's less than a whole. And it's just a little bit more than a half. That thinking about the first fraction is going to really help me solve which ones of these four could be an equivalent. I'm going to start here because I quite like the look of this one. It's got the same digits, ah, but they mean something completely different, don't they? Because in this one, when I'm in quarters, it means that my whole is divided into four equal parts and I've got seven of those equal parts. That's more than a whole, so it can't possibly be seven quarters. Let's come down here. I'm quite liking the look of this one because I've got eight fourteenths. And as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking sevenths and fourteenths, they do have a relationship, don't they? Yeah, it's a, it's a scale of two. So seven to 14, I've got to multiply by two. If I've done that to the denominator, I need to do it to the numerator as well. Four, yeah. Four scaled up by two is eight. So that one is a definite. I wonder if any of the others are also equivalent to four sevenths. Let's have a quick look. I'm looking now here at denominator of eight and seven. Do you know, I can use my times tables and I know that that's not going to be in the same family of fractions, is it? So that means that five eighths, even though it is just a little bit more than a half, it's not in the same family of fractions. It's not going to be an equivalent. And the same is true of this one. OK, I think there is only one answer to this and it is, I'm right, 8 fourteenths. Did you get that one right too? OK, so we are on our final uh, problem for today before we move on to uh, a practice activity for the next lesson. Let's have a look at our question, shall we? Show where each fraction on the number line is by converting to eighths. Oh, I like that. I like that bit because what that's telling me is that each of the fractions above is in the eighths family of fractions. Let's have a look. We could check it by using our times tables knowledge, couldn't we? Because we're on eighths. So eight, 16, 24, oh, there's no 30 seconds, 40, 48, yep, and 72. They are all in the eight times table. Right, now I've checked that, I'm happy for you to have a go on your own. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to find an equivalent fraction with them all in eighths, and I'd like you to put them on the number line. I wonder which one's going to be the smallest? I wonder which one's going to be the biggest fraction? OK, welcome back. What we're looking for is where you've put these on the number line. Yep, 9 twenty-fourths is equivalent to 3 eighths. Wow, that's a hard one to say, isn't it? 36 40 eighths is equivalent to 6 eighths. I quite like the way that that is equivalent to 6 eighths because I've got a picture in my mind of what 6 eighths looks like, but I find 36 40 eighths quite hard. Or did you spot 12 sixteenths, 36 48ths and 6 eighths are all fractions that have the same value but a different appearance. 10 fortieths is the same value as 2 eighths but a different appearance. Now this one, I wonder if this one with this really big number here in the denominator, I wonder if you've decided it's a smaller fraction or if it's a larger fraction. Yeah, no, we don't just look at the number in the denominator, do we? We need to look at the whole of the fraction, the numerator and the denominator. And when we do that, it's equivalent of one eighth. Well done, you've done really, really good learning today. Now, before you go, have a look at how I'm going to take you through an activity that's going to help you with your practice one. 
OK, so this is going to be a challenge that's going to help prepare you for your next lesson. I want you to look at this calculation and I want you to see. Yeah, it's different to the ones we've been doing, isn't it? Because up until now, we've been looking at equivalent fractions only. And this time the calculation is a subtraction. OK. It's a little bit of technical language. We're looking at a minuend of two fourteenths and a subtrend of one seventh. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at these fractions. Yeah, have you seen them before? We've looked at them a few times in this last couple of lessons. You're right, they are equivalent fractions. Ah, so what I want us to do is I want us to think. If we turn these into integers, if the minuend and the subtrend was the same, let's just imagine that our number was three. Three take away three would leave us with zero, wouldn't it? That's right. So what we're asking here is, is it the same when we deal with fractions? Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is, because fractions are numbers. That's going to help you to look at the final slide, which is our practice activity, so that you're ready for your next lesson. Have fun.